pleasure for me to talk a little bit about my research on um, a viral genome structure and how that affects the, the capsid diameter. Uh, and I'd also like to give you a very brief introduction to uh, the sorts of bioinformatics that we're doing in, at, at uh, the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics. Um, so I personally have a, a, a number of research interests. I'm best known for my work with RNA structure. And right now I have a, a project on uh, learning the structure of RNA by deep learning. That's, that's making some good progress. And um, I also have a um, manuscript submitted to NAR on, on viral genome structure. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and then on more agricultural side, I have uh, lots, lots of interests uh, where I just, that I'm basically just getting started on. Um, I, I'm very interested uh, in desertification um, uh, and uh, carbon sequestration, of course, for climate remediation. Um, and how we do it, for example, techniques, uh, agroforestry techniques. Um, I'm interested in soil, soil metagenomics. I'm inter especially interested in how, uh, what soil metagenomics can, be, can tell us about carbon sequestration. Can we determine how much carbon is being sequestered? Uh, and in what way, using metagenomics. And lastly, I have a number of uh, bioinformatics teaching interests, and I'll tell you about the courses that we have coming up in this section. Elsewhere in the section, uh, well, we're, we're, we're very well known, uh, especially because of Eric von Kamludov's work in international development. Uh, so the, it, there are lots of projects ongoing in Asia, Africa, and in the Americas, basically trying to um, improve the standard of living uh, food security, that sort of thing, uh, for people in the um, in the poorest regions of the world. Now, this is also something I'm interested in. I, I, we have a couple. I have been involved in a couple of projects. Um, we have the work of cattle cattle genetics and metagenomics, for example, over the note, and I'm helping a little bit on the metagenomic side. Um, and then um, there are people working on crop genetics and epigenetics. There's a project that Eric is driving in, is running in Africa. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've been involved a little bit in that also. Uh, there's a uh, project on environmental, environmental metagenomics and antibiotic resistance. So I've got idea of taking care of that. Uh, there's a project on, on uh, biofuels. Uh, and lastly, there's uh, genetic, uh, genetic diseases using uh, Sataria for, uh, as, a, as a model for certain other uh, nematodes, uh, nematode parasites that uh, infect humans. Um, so the, the topic I'd like to talk to you about today is, again, viral genome structure. Um, so many of you have seen structures of viral capsids, and they're, they're just beautiful things, gigantic structures as molecules go. Uh, and they've been resolved like it all, with all atoms, um, but only for the protein capsid. Uh, what some of you might not um, be aware of is that we have zero structures about the, uh, for the atomic structure of the DNA that's inside the virus. And so even though we've had capsid structures since, since the 70s, today we do not have a single structure of the viral genome. And, I, and it, it's, it's something that, 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 that's gonna tell us a lot about how, how the DNA is packaged. And um, it's a very basic problem, um, so I can't tell you specifically uh, what therapy or intervention is gonna come out of it, but I can tell you that we really do need to understand packaging if we're ever gonna have uh, you know, future, future therapies uh, against viruses. And also, if we're ever gonna make really effective use of viruses as therapeutic vehicles. Like for example, with uh, phage virus therapy, with for gene editing or, or uh, maybe phage therapy, that sort of thing. Um, so, so the problem is is, is that the, um, the tools for protein modeling are always well ahead of tools for nucleic acid modeling, just just because there's so many more people working on it. Uh, there's so much more money in it, um, and. And so, so as, as, as a result, we don't, we don't have um, automated tools uh, uh, nearly to the, to the degree that we have them for, for proteins. Um, 
there's also a problem with data, which for the same reasons we don't have as much uh, data on nucleic acid structures than we do for protein. Again, there's less interest, there's fewer structures, fewer people doing working on it. Um, and then um, the other problem we have in the case of viral genomes is that the density maps are just not very clear. They um, some of them are not bad, but they're 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 typically going to be less clear than the protein. The protein density for for a few reasons that we can get into, um, but some of them, but but the, but so 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 we face this challenge and we we don't give up, um, but we do look for a solution. Like what what can we do here? And so so one thing I tried early on was just going a little at a time and following what density I could see and try to try to fit the DNA in there. And my tools are pretty good for this sort of thing. Uh, I have to say, I mean, they, they, because they don't require you to flexibilize the entire um, the entire DNA at once, so you can focus on, on the things you care about, like, you know, just have a little moving window of flexibility, and you can just kind of help it along and, and, and fit it in, in, into uh, different places uh, until you eventually get the whole genome. So I tried that for a while. It didn't work, because it just, some of these density maps are so bad. This one's actually not too bad. Uh, but some of these density maps are so bad that you just can't see it. Like, you, even if you had infinite time, you wouldn't be able to finish it because you just don't know where it's going. Um, for example, even this map, which is a pretty good map, uh, as you get toward the sensor, the, the, the density starts to become completely unclear at short range. However, what we can see, uh, and which is, of course, already known for some time, is that, is that there's spiral symmetry for double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, and so, so we can, and we can see that applies in this case. Um, so we say, okay, well, what if, we took a completely different approach and said, okay, what if we look at, uh, if we just assume there's going to be a spiral, uh, some sort of spiral geometry, and we say, okay, well, let's just start with some kind of spiral onslaughts, you know, and then, um, and then adjust this spiral, the parameters of the spiral, um, the pitch, um, you know, the, the radius, uh, all, all that, that sort of thing, it, until we get the best possible fit. And it turns out that doing this is really fast, really fast. Uh, for for a single eval evaluation, never more than two minutes. Sometimes just seconds. Uh, and, what we, uh, and 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 in addition to being very fast, it's also extremely accurate, much more accurate than the previous method, me method that I mentioned. Why? Because if you do this a piece, a little piece at a time, as most humans would try to do it you're limited by the resolution. However, if you do the, the an entire stretch of DNA at once, you can integrate over a, lots of density. And in this way, you get uh, improvement by, uh, you can improve the accuracy uh, by integrating over more data, right? So here, for example, you're, you're, you're sampling the density at all these points along this entire spiral all the way up to the end. In fact, you can do several spirals at once. And and that that's going to that's going to improve your accuracy to the point that that this this thing um, this pitch, for instance, you can get that to within a tenth of an angstrom, right? Same thing with the diameter. Um, there, you know, the center point and, and all these dimensions, we can get them extremely accurate, well well beyond the resolution limit. Um, and so so we were really excited just to have a method, um, but. But what's even more exciting is that we get the first shot at explaining how the packaging actually happens in this virus. Right? But I'll get to that. Um, the, 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 the next thing we noticed as we're working on this is, um, of course, we have a spiral here on this kind of cylindrical portion of, of, the, of the virus. This is what I mean by the cylindrical portion. But then we have these end caps here and here. I'm going to call this the um, spindle cap um, because this is where the DNA exits or, or enters. Um, and here we have a different packaging scheme. So, so we have to, when we look at the, the spindle cap, for instance, we see that there are, there's some, it looks like there's some sort of circular structure here. Right? So if we, if we were to just, just naively explain this density by staring at it, we would say, oh, there's some sort of circular DNA there. And I, I really, it's just so clear that I thought, well, maybe it is, there is circular DNA in there. And I talked to the, the people that generated this density map and they said, no, there's no way that that's circular. 
that they're just impossible. It's, it's verified. And, and so, so, so then that, that means that this is some sort of artifact, right? But before we get into what sort of artifact, no, I'll just point out another, another few interesting things is that, um, that this, this first ring is really clear, but if you go to the second ring, it's not so clear, right? You can start to see it gets a little bit blurry, noisy. And then if you go to the third ring, that's even less clear. Um, and so we have some sort of idea that we can see, we can even go to the fourth ring here and say, okay, there, there are four rings here, at least four. Um, you know, and I just kind of believe me that you can kind of figure out that there's kind of a fourth ring, not very clear at all. Um, but uh, but at any rate, uh, I'm just going to assert for now that there are four rings in this end, and there's a different number of rings on the other end, which I'll explain. But the the point is that we that it's very curious. Number one, that this um, that this density is circular, and that and that there are four, and that the clarity diminishes as the as the radius increases, which is actually the opposite of the trend in the rest of the virus. Okay, so all these things have to come together in a way that explains also how this DNA turns around, right? Because because I said this this DNA goes let's let's say let's say that the the, um, the the end of the DNA that was first inserted, uh, like the the early arriving terminus is, is here, um, then it goes up it goes up all the way up the 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 cylindrical part, and it has to come back down, but, has, but in the middle it has to turn around, right? So, so it, everything kind of works. If you assume it just makes a certain kind of like a, a loop like that, it comes back down, right? And then it comes down here, and it makes a loop here, right? And that starts to explain things because, um, because I'll, I'll argue in a second that that explains why this loop is the clearest, right? So, so this is the first loop, it's, a, it's the tightest loop, it's the one of the smallest diameter, comes back up, goes like this, goes all the way up to the end, like that, and that turns around, right? And you know something about this. So let's say it's the center point. The angle is subtended by, by this arc. It's quite a large angle in the case of that first loop. But when you get to the second loop, like this, this thing has to exit a little bit earlier, and it has to come in into the loop a little bit later, right? So this angle is actually smaller. So, so the, the fact that it's less clear can be explained by sort of a less of a circular arc. So, so, so if in reality this, this arc here is almost, you know, maybe getting close to 360 degrees, this arc over here has to be less than that, right? And, and, so, so, and then we have rotational averaging because we don't know because there's a, there's a five-fold axis of symmetry, and so when we cluster these images together, we don't know which which one of those five-fold, uh, you know, what which one of those orientations a particular image belongs to. So so they just get averaged in together, and hence that's why you get a circle instead of a circular arc in the density. Uh, at least that's our explanation, and I have not heard a better one. Um, then then you go to the next arc, and that one has to have even less of a angle coverage. And, and then the next one has even less. And that, again, this explains progressively less and less clarity. All right. And so I said there was four turnarounds here. There's going to be a different number up there. And I'm going to, uh, and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So first, um, uh, I would just want to reiterate that what we have here is um, that we're starting with a spiral onslaught. And so where, where we have um, spherical regions, we're going to use a spherical spiral. And where we have cylindrical regions, we're going to use a, a cylindrical spiral, right? And so, so the so the spherical spiral, like I said, it, it, that's what you use over here in the end cap, actually in both end caps, and then over here you use this um, this cylindrical spiral. And this process that that I was explaining to you earlier here, I'm showing it with a different perspective. Uh, remember, this is the spindle end. The DNA comes in, goes all the way up to the end of the, of the virus, turns around. And we propose that it parks here. So that's the early terminus of the DNA. Then it goes up the cylindrical part of the virus. Uh, and we um, showed you earlier that it has to happen in a spiral. And then when it gets to the far end, it's going to take the, the smallest diameter it can and turn around. And there's actually something, at least on this end, there's something guiding that diameter. And we'll get to that in a, in a bit. 
and then comes back down, right? Again, here, here this part, we're just kind of flattening it out, but it, you understood that it was a spiral. Uh, and it makes this turn, right? And again, you can see that it's a, a kind of a relatively large subtended angle here, right? Then it goes up, makes a turn over here, comes back down, makes this turn over here, comes back up, makes this turn, comes back down, and that's the fourth turn over here. The fourth turn over here is the last one. And then um, we're getting going to the last loop. And if you count these strands, one, two, three, that's 10. Like, um, actually, I forgot to mention that. That was something we, we, we that was the, one of the first things we, we, we learned was, was that there, there are 10, what we call 10 points of entry. And that means that there have to be five turnarounds up here because every strand that goes up and comes back down has to have a, has a turnaround. So for every two strands that are in this cylinder, there has to be one turn up here, right? And so that up here, that makes five turns, right? And then down here. And I say those four turns on this end because we have the early terminus and we have the, la the, the late arriving end of the DNA, uh, which is gonna come down here. It's gonna find there's no more room and then it's gonna skip over and start packing the next shell. And that packaging process will proceed exactly like this one, right? Uh, just, just in slightly less space. Uh, so, so yeah, so again, four, four turns here and then five turns up here. Uh, so, so if n is a point, number of points of entry, then, then over here we have n over two turns, and over here we have n over two minus one turn. That's gonna be uh, important because it's going to explain to us um, why it's going to end up, it's going to get a, end up giving us some very important properties of the virus. So he, here's another view of the same. So what you're looking here at here is um, the, the spindle end of, of, the, of the virus. Uh, and here, here on the left, um, just a density without any DNA. And then in the middle, I've started to, um, to fit in some of the DNA. So as I mentioned, um, the first DNA to kind of get wound uh, maybe comes in like this, makes probably most of the full circle like that. Again, accounting for the very clear density, like the, just the fact that we have a lot of DNA uh, filling in almost, almost all it can in terms of the circle and it comes back out. And so, so again, th these two strands are gonna be parallel in the cylindrical part. Remember, it's, a, it's actually a little bit hard to, to, um, to draw this because there's not a real good projection um, that we can do here. And then, um, then it goes up, turns around in the distal cap, comes down, and then uh, makes the next turn. And what's very uncertain here is how far in this goes. It could have been like this, the way, I've, I've, the way it's, is shown here or could have gotten a little bit further in and then come back out. But in any case, the, the point is that there's less of an angle or less of this arc that's being made. Right? Here I'm drawing it maybe, I don't know, something like 200 degrees of an arc. So, so it's less than the innermost loop. Um, and then the third loop, so, th so this goes up about, turns around the end cap, comes back down. And then um, the third loop goes kind of like this. And again, we don't know exactly far, how far in it goes and it comes back out. But in any case, at this point, it's getting to be quite a, quite a small amount uh, of, of DNA in the track, and, um, and uh, correspondingly, this, the, the density for this track is actually getting quite unclear, right? although you can, still, you can still see it, I think, like this. Uh, and then lastly, there's the, 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 the fourth turnaround, and this one, this one is, is quite, is that, I think, Reasonably hard to see, and I don't know how long it is, but it, it could be, it could be reasonably short. Uh, and um, we have to remember that we have to leave a little bit of space for the um, for the early terminus, like the, the, the terminus of the DNA that gets inserted first. That's going to part somewhere in this spindle cap. Um, and then, and then the last, the the, the late terminus uh, when it comes down. It has used up the last of the 10 tracks along the cylindrical portion. So there's no room for it to go back up into the cylinder. And this, 
the whole spindle cap should be full. And so it's forced to then jump up, jump inwards to start filling, out, filling in the next shell. And, um, and, and I propose that, that it follows pretty much the same pattern uh, for, as, as it did for the outermost shell. Okay, and this is where it gets really interesting and where the, the quantization that I spoke of uh, comes in. So, so I told you that there's four turnarounds at, at the spindle cap. Um, the first one here, and then the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, right? And, and, you, could, and you could pretty much see that uh, from, from the density rings, but I'm showing it to you a different way. So let's just say that we take one of these rings and we vary the, the, the theta angle. So that, that's, that's this angle. So if, if we're working cylindrical coordinates, um, so there's, there's some sort of arrow uh, pointing from the center of, sorry, not, I meant spherical coordinates. There's some sort of arrow pointing from the center of this um, sphere, and it's got a certain radius and a certain theta angle, right, from this, from its um, axis. Um, so we're varying this angle, and that's what we're doing here, and we're looking at the energy, right? And so there's clearly a dip in energy here corresponding to what we call ring four. And there's another dip here, another dip here, and another dip here. So I think those are four very clear minimum, minima, very uncontroversial. Um, and, and again, they, they gave us a, a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good, good idea of where those, those rings are. And it turns out that, that they're spaced uh, just about the right distance to be, to be DNA. Uh, so that, that one's not so controversial. And then, um, and then what we do is we, we vary the radius now. That's what we're doing up here. Um, and so, 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 so the same sort of um, angular position, but we're gonna scan from something s slightly bigger than this shell and then all the way inwards, right? So, so we get a minimum as this radius, uh, let's say we start the radius like out here somewhere, and we, we decrease it and um, we get a minimum here. Uh, at the, you know, the, uh, for the corresponding to the outermost shell. Um, and then we can see one, or sorry, two, three, and maybe a fourth, right? That, that fourth is absolutely debatable. Uh, it, it's quite noisy and it's a very shallow minimum, but I'm gonna argue that it's a real minimum. And uh, uh, you'll, you'll hopefully get a little better idea by, by the time I get to the end of this slide. Um, but, but anyway, going back to, to the anger position, so, so we started out here shell one, and then we go inwards to shell two. Um, and here we again scan theta, right? And so we can see a minimum here, corresponding to ring four, another minimum here, ring three, another one ring two, two and ring one, right? So, so these, these four minima, right? And they kind of look like they're more or less packing hexagonally, uh, not quite, but, but reasonably close. Um, and, and, and again, distance between rings is, is about right for DNA. Uh, so so we, we can be, I think we, that one's pretty credible. Then we go to shell three. And here we look, we, we're again varying theta. Or look what happens here. So we got some kind of double minimum. So the, that, that's just, I would just call it noise. Um, then there's a minimum here for ring three, but it's, you know, you could argue it's not quite, quite exactly the right distance. Then there's another minimum, basically a double minimum here for ring two. And then there's ring one, which looks like it's pretty clearly not at the optimal distance. Uh, so, so there starts to be some geometric effects maybe, but mostly I think it's just, it's just noise that we're looking at. It's starting to get worse and worse as we go inwards. And, and it's gonna be turned out that there are reasons for the noise to get worse. Um, lastly, we get to shell four. And here, look what happens. Do you see any minima at all? No, right? I mean, it, there's just basically no minimum, no minima. Uh, but I would argue that the DNA is most likely there again. Um, and the reasons are that it's just too perfect in every other way for it to be anything other than a, a, an additional shell of DNA. So here, here's, here's what's happening. Here's what I think is happening. Um, we've got this portal protein, right? Um, right here, this, this cyan colored, colored protein. Um, and I think if you stare at it, you'll notice something here. I 
to the surface. What do you think of that surface there? If you've looked at proteins much, you might, be, you might remark that it's extremely smooth, actually, by the standards of proteins. Usually these proteins have loops sticking up, they've got a piece of secondary structure here and there. They're, they're, you, it's actually quite rare to see a, a very smooth surface on a protein like this. And then it's funnel shape. It's a perfect funnel shape, uh, narrowing down to this sort of spigot here, right? And this angle that it makes is just right to, to be perpendicular to the capsid. Uh, so it, it, it's suspiciously perfect, uh, perfect in, in my opinion. It is just the right length to where it would fit exactly four shells and then and the rest of the shells would have to follow some different scheme in terms of their winding. Um, and, and so that's why I think that that, that, that fourth shell exists and follows pretty much probably the same pattern as the other, the other shells. Uh, why is it noisier? Well, there are a few reasons for that, as I alluded earlier. Um, the first, first think about what these DNA are resting against. So, so the DNA on the outermost shell is resting directly against the protein capsid. So it's got something to register against, something that's going to be the same on every virus, right? The second shell, uh, you know, it, it, on this side, it's still resting against the poor protein, but here it's resting on the DNA, which has, has, has the, on the outer shell DNA. So if there's any movement, any, any differences in the way that the outer shell was packed, that will be uh, accentuated in the, in the second shell, because the second shell also has, it's going to have its own variation. If, you know, for thermal reasons, or just the, the packaging is likely going to go just a little bit different er for every shell. Uh, and then by the time you get to shell three, you've got, um, you, you, you're now sitting on top of a shell which is itself not terribly stable. Uh, and, you know, and, and so, the, so the, the, these variations are just going to keep adding up and up. And that's why you get, you're averaging over a whole bunch of viruses, all of them being a little different, and you start to get more and more blurring. Um, the, other, the other thing is that as you get closer to the center of, of the virus, um, we have less, just less density to integrate over. So when we're looking, so when we're making our sort of pseudo-atom DNA and integrating over the, the, the density in the circular path, we're simply integrating over less density and so it, it, we have, get less noise reduction that way. Um, so, so, so we expect no, more noise as we go inwards. Um, and um, but but it, but th but there's a there's a, a consistent geometric picture that indicates to me that that again that this four shell is is real. Now going back to this issue of the of of the of this shell or this portal protein having just the right length here uh, to to accommodate four shells. Well, and obviously it's symmetric, so it's obviously going to have exactly the same distance here. Um, and we said that this distance is controlled. It's just that there's a certain distance between DNA strands, uh, and there are four of them, so we know how long that part is. This part is also interesting in that it's 4.7 nanometers, so that's close to the smallest diameter for circular DNA. Smallest diameter you can have without actually um, making it not be double helical anymore. So, and it's very similar also to the, the diameter of histone. So, 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 so it's, it's quite, um, uh, I think there's the, the, the circumstantial evidence is certainly there to, to say that it's, um, it, it, it's something that could be conserved across viruses and, and, has, and has special significance. Uh, so, so I think this diameter here, we're gonna treat it as something that's, that's kind of a, a bit of a constant, like could vary a bit perhaps, but it's going to, but there are reasons for it to be that number. Um, and then, and then again, we, we expect this length to be the same as it was on, on the other side of this portal protein. And then over here, again, just the, just the four interhelical distance, distances long. And then there's gonna be some, a little bit of transition zone here and here, um, because there's, there's turnarounds and so on before it becomes, it goes into this cylindrical spiral. The point is, you add up this length, this length, this length, this length, and this length, and you get a very specific uh, diameter, which is a diameter which is dependent on the number of turns, which again is dependent on, on the number of points of entry, and on the number of shells. So, so there, there are two possibilities here. There's one, one possibility that these two numbers, this, this four, four turns and four shells, 
the first possibility is that, that those are that's going to be a constant across the entire curaviruses family, which means that all future curaviruses that are discovered should have pretty much the same diameter. Right? There's another possibility that these both of these parameters are under genetic control, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Um, so there could be some other virus that ha doesn't have four shells. That maybe their, their portal protein is just a big dip, just just one one step bigger. And so then it can accommodate five shells, or maybe fewer shells. And also, it, it's possible that there are other curative viruses that don't have 10 points of entry. Maybe they have eight, maybe they have, they have 12, I don't know. Um, and that would, either, either way, that would change the number of turnarounds. And so that would change the diameter, but this, but I'm making, I want to make this point very carefully and clearly, it would change the diameter in a stepwise way, right? Not in a continuous way. So, so, um, so there are certain diameters that that we expect to find in nature. Um, and unfortunately, there's also a little bit of blurring in, in, those, in those diameters because again, there's this, there's this transition zone which we don't, uh, we don't know the rules for that and it and it's, doesn't appear to be particularly discrete. Um, but, but, but keep these possibilities in mind that, that these, these numbers are concerned, conserved, therefore other members of the family would be the same diameter or that they're under genetic control and that they're being varied which means that we should find other diameters but following a certain certain pattern. Uh, and unfortunately, since, it, since there are two, two discrete numbers here, um, that, uh, that, that, that it might actually be kind of hard to discriminate um, whether it is indeed uh, quantized in this way. Uh, we, we might, but anyway, that, that's, the, that's the prediction. Uh, so then we go to the cylindrical portion and um, we notice a few interesting things. Like first, first I, I fit a spiral here, or, or really ten spirals, and I uh, and I look at the energy and, and um, you know I optimize the parameters. And then what I did is, is I, I I scanned over radius, right? So I, so I made the radius a little bit bigger than this, and then scanned all the way down to zero. And I first saw okay, first here's this first minimum for shell one, the one I basically started with, and then there's another minimum for shell two and shell three, and shell four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way down to nine. I, I would argue that those minima are quite clear. There's really no noise. And that, that's because they, I'm able to integrate over so much density that I'm able to average out the noise. Um, but, so I'm fairly confident that, that there are nine shells, okay? That's not to say that all shells are the same, right? So I told you that there's a limit to for, for how many follow this nested arc turnaround rule. And that's four, uh, four shells, because that, that's how many you can stack up on the portal protein. And then after that, um, there's also a limit for an uh, upper limit for how many uh, for 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 how many shells can still have ten points of entry, right? Because every time you make the 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 diameter of the shell smaller, this pitch has to become steeper, right? And it gets to the point where where, where this pitch is effectively vertical, right? And then you can't fit any, after that point, you can't fit more than 10. And so that, that, that limit is here at 3.6 nanometers uh, of radius. Um, but actually I would argue that, that, that we get, that we stop having the 10 points of entry at even larger diameters than that. Um, and actually after shell six or, or from shell six inwards, um, we, I don't know how these are being packaged. Like the, 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 get, the data gets noisy and I can't find um, a combination of points of entry uh, and pitch and, and radius and so on, or, or pitch, that would, um, that would explain, uh, you know, that would tell me what, how, it, very clearly how many points of entry I have. So, it's, so, so that part is unclear. So it's clear to me that there are shells there, it's not clear to me how many points of entry they have. Um, okay. And uh, there's one more thing that's interesting. So you, you, see, you see that the, the, the way these pack they're packing hexagonally. Uh, you know, the, the each each strand, each shell, each successive shell, uh, it packs in such a way to maximize, uh, to, to minimize dead space, right? And so that continues on, on shell three, like this, and shell four, um, and then shell five. So shell five is still following this hexagonal packing, but then shell six, look at that. Shell six does not pack hexagonally. It has exactly the same sort of phase. As shell five, 
And this is this is one thing that I have absolutely no explanation for. I would really, really love for somebody to just throw hypotheses at me because I cannot find any reason why I should be this way. And yet the data is, is, is not noisy. It, it's, it's actually quite quite clear. Uh, so, so, so in my mind, it's, it's, um, it's clear that they have the same phase. Um, it's, I'm, I'm saying that because look at, look at shell six, and shell five and shell six. This is the, the energy versus um, sort of the phi naught, the rotation, initial rotation of, of the shell about, about the virus axis. And so for shell five, um, we have uh, this blue trace. And you see it's got a minimum here around somewhere around 13 degrees. And then shell six, so this is shell five. Let me just point to the shell five. And then for shell six, that's an orange trace. That's also got a minimum around, let's say maybe around 12 degrees. It's basically the same, the same location. Um, whereas all the others are alternating um, 18 degrees, right? So, so, if, so if one is, is 12 degrees, the next one will be um, something like 30 degrees. And then the next one will be 12 degrees again, and then 30 degrees, like alternating as, as you go inwards. So what's happening in shell six? That I do not know. I would, again, would really love for somebody to try to figure that out. Um, we, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that there, these quantum numbers might be conserved across the entire family, or they might, they might vary, in which case they, they would expect them to vary in certain discrete steps. Right? So when it is like, I, I thought, well, then, then some of these have been observed in, in micrographs, like they have, not by cryogen, but, but, but in single, um, single particle emissions, they've been observed. Right? So, so what it is, is I, I, I cut these out of the original publication along with their scale bars, and then scaled them just inside Adobe Illustrator until the scale bars lined up. And then I traced the inner diameter of the capset, SU10, across all the micrographs, right? And sure enough, like this, if you look at this one, it looks like it has exactly the same inner diameter as SU10. Same thing here, and same thing here. This one, it's not, like it's not at all, it, it, it doesn't seem to have the same diameter, but at the same time, it's also very poor resolution. So it could be down to that. And then there's another one over here, which doesn't have the same diameter. Um, and we don't know if it's because it's, it, ha it chose different quantum numbers or because it uses a different packing scheme because it's not a coronavirus, uh, bar it's not a member of the coronavirus family. It's it's reasonably closely related, but it's not quite the same. So it's like a pandas and bears, let's say. Uh, yeah, so, so um, we, we're gonna have to wait for, for more experimental results to, to I, would, I would say, to confirm this. But, but so far, this, the, the other experiments are at least consistent with this, with this theory. Uh, I told you that I'm interested in pedagogical development. I, I've um, gotten three rounds of funding from Stockholm University to improve our bioinformatics course at the master's level. And I've implemented um, things like, like flipped classrooms. So that means that, that we have, uh, instead of having conventional lectures, we record the lectures, uh, upload them, let's say, to YouTube, and um, people are expected to, to watch them and then um, do an assigned reading. And then when they show up for class, it's not really, it's no longer a lecture, it's, it's a discussion. So when they show up for class, that they're expected to start, they were sorted to have handed in a quiz online, or completed a quiz online, and it's an automated quiz, so it doesn't take that much time to, for, uh, to grade. Um, but the point of the quiz is just to enforce the, the readings and the, the videos. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it works. Um, people do, do read, and we do have much better discussions than, than if I just lecture directly and then um, hope that they've read, done the reading and then, uh, because most people just will not. Most people believe that we read until later. Um, we implemented spaced repetition, and the way we do it is that um, people see the, the same topics several different ways and several different times. Like, they, like again, they had the video, they had the reading, they had the um, pre-discussion quiz, they had the discussion itself. Then we have a lab, and then at the end of the lab, there's a lab quiz, and then. Then um, later on, there's going to be a final report and a final exam. So, the, so the same, same, the same topics they, they've seen several different ways uh, at, at, at different times. Uh, 
so the, 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 the most, um, this is one of the most uh, conclusive results of, of pedagogical research over the last several decades has been that people learn much better um, if, this, if, if it's repeated, and especially if it's the examinations that are repeated. So we have more examinations in this course than on least, least any other course that I ever took as a student. Um, there, there's actually more than one examination per day on average, something like one, one and a half examinations per day. Um, then we have um, supplemental instruction, peer assist student study sessions. So these are sessions that where you sit not with a teacher or a TA, but with a fellow student from the previous year who, who leads the group through their studying. Um, and that, that, has, that has helped a lot, I think. Uh, we, we've got, just gotten some money from Stockholm University to, 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 pay, to pay the students uh, the, as iPass leaders. Um, lab virtualization, we, have, um, we don't have compu computer rooms anymore. Um, I, ha I have a server, it's just a little 32 core server, but I have all the software people need on it. And so they all get logins, they, they can work on there. Um, or they can, most of the labs actually have moved to, to some sort of notebook, like let's say Google Colab, um, or they, they can do all their, 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 their bioinformatics lab in a browser. Um, we've dedicated a, a bit of, uh, I think a good effort in, um, in fixing the gender balance. And I feel like, because traditionally it's been a, a very poor gender balance in bioinformatics, um, but uh, you know we, we've we've taken courses and we've uh, seminars and uh, um, thought about why it is that that women were not uh, attracted to bio the the topic of bioinformatics, and um, and we fixed a lot of the issues. There's been a lot of social issues, for example, people being aggressive and the way they ask questions and the way they discuss things. Um, and so the gender balance uh, has been improving. In fact, I also run a, uh, a research school in bioinformatics. Uh, it's called MedBioInfo for, for PhD students. And um, there we started out with, with quite a, a, poor, um, uh, a poor male to female ratio. So, so something under like maybe a quarter of our students were female. And I'm proud to say that in 2021, it finally reached 50%. And now we're, we're just sort of hovering around that, uh, maybe maybe a little bit below fifty percent, but but um, but we're no longer um, really a, a, an imbalanced field, and, and, and as far as I can see. Um, then um, so right now I'm running a couple of courses. There's BK 0001 bioinformatics here at SLU, and um, in December there's going to be a PhD course on machine learning and agricultural bioinformatics. And I really encourage um, PhD students to take this. We're going to be focused on um, machine vision, um, but you're going to find that, that machine vision techniques are really not different from techniques used to analyze sequence data. Uh, so so that, that, would be, that should give you a good introduction that will give, actually give you, an, give you some tools that you might be able to use immediately in your problem. And, um, and if, it, if your problem need, requires more sophisticated tools, well, this will give you an introduction, uh, for a, a stepping stone towards uh, further learning. Uh, and that is all I have uh, on the science, and I would like to thank you all for listening and then turn it over for questions.